Hey Dream Team, Eric Gephardt here coming to you live from Wichita, Kansas, all things barbecue. Uh, this is kind of a neat moment for us to interact before the block party, which is actually Saturday, but we got a lot of field trips to make. We're going to go to a, uh, again, we're here in Kansas, but there's this amazing aquaculture uh, place where they're actually raising live shrimp, saltwater shrimp. So we're going to go uh, bring some videos to you uh, from there. We're going to go to a beef farm. Uh, a lot of fun things coming up. I'm the Chief Culinary Officer or Director of Culinary Inspiration for Kamada Joe. Uh, just want to kind of welcome you guys to the event because not everybody's able to make it out to Wichita, Kansas. So I know we posted that we were going to do this and some folks have some, uh, some questions and just kind of want to connect with you. That's what this is all about is making meaningful connections with as many people as possible. So uh, Josh, what do we got over there? We got any great, great questions so far? It's a great question. Uh, I would start by saying the people first. You know, that's that's a that's a generic, but the true answer. Uh, everybody who works for Camacho is just so darn passionate about it. Uh, of course, there's points of differentiation uh, between our grills and anybody else's grill. Again, we can talk about uh, uh, heat signatures and thickness of of the actual dome. Uh, but if you look behind me, I don't know, can we see this behind me? You got this great latch system, and you know, safety is one of the biggest things. When I've had restaurants in the past, you know, people think your number one job is actually cooking amazing food. It's actually safety. So when I'm having these in a, in a restaurant or at home and I'm cooking with my five-year-old, uh, I dare you to lift any other lid in the market space and look at how their lid reacts. Look at, I mean, look at this. I'm lifting it with a pinky. So that new air hinge system, and we've got some great folks out of New York to, to design that for us, uh, is certainly a point of differentiation. Uh, and these are some 2017 uh, items that, that we've changed. The gasket material, unbelievable. The latch system, new and improved. We've got this great ash device that you're able just to slide that in and slide that out and take out all your dirty ash. Uh, this new top is unbelievable as well. So every time you open a lot of these Kamada style grills, you're inadvertently, every single time you open it, you're changing your thermostat, right? So if when I want to make this thing hotter, I give it more airflow, uh, on a lot of these, a lot of these Kamado style grills, you open it up and it slams shut or slams wide open. Here we've got something that will not only keep the elements out, but it'll also stay right where you want it to. So those are just a couple brief talking points about some of the things. The firebox is also brand new. We've got different panels, which, uh, uh, has been helping out a lot not not having those things break on us. What else we got, Josh? Uh, somebody asked about how you handle cooking multiple heat zones at once. Great question. So the Big Joe comes with this big uh, stainless steel piece, and so you've got uh, pretty much two hemispheres, right? Uh, but what I like to do, you know, the, the divide and conquer system that comes with these grills, uh, you can set it in and you can have you can have a grill grate on one one side at this at this height and then a grill grate at this height and a deflector shield here so let's do something as easy as uh, cooking burgers right cheeseburgers so I, I'd get my grilling done here and when I was ready to flip it up and just melt the cheese I could put it right here there'd be a deflector shield so all of a sudden within one surface I've got a hot side and then I've got a less hot side where I'm able to treat the exact same grill face two separate ways. And that's just one instance. You know, there's, there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, it's all about versatility and cooking the way you want to. That's the beauty of the Kamada Joe. You can really treat that flame how you want to. There's, there's 40 different ways with different accessories to play around with and, and cope that exactly how you want it to cook. Right, uh, so I'm from Hillsborough, North Carolina, beautiful little historic town just outside Chapel Hill in Durham. Um, but I've uh, been traveling all around with the Kamada Joe block party, so I'm sure some of that's rubbing off. You know, we've got Germany coming up, had Australia, got Australia coming up again, just came from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, but uh, yeah, Hillsborough, North Carolina, come check us out, beautiful town. Yeah, well, that's, that's a great question. So I've been working on a cookbook for about seven years and been talking to Bobby about this. 
uh, it's, it's hard for me because I share 100% of my recipes. Whenever we go to these block parties, I bring the actual book, I set it down, I let people take pictures of it. I want people to have access to all the recipes. In fact, all these great Facebook forums uh, that we're on and, and, and the pages and Kamada Joe, I mean, it's a great wealth of information. We're just all interconnected in a global way that we never have been before. Uh, and it's a great opportunity to, to share recipes. So if I ever came up with the best way to do something in my mind, I'm giving it all away. Uh, but a book to have that categorized and be able to hand that to somebody would be really something special for me that, that I look forward to that day when I can do that. Uh, so I'll, I'll keep you posted on it. You know, I've been a chef in New York, Naples, Florida, New Zealand, North Carolina, of course, had a couple restaurants and uh, worked in a lot better restaurants than, than, uh, than, than I've actually owned, you know, under some amazing, amazing chefs. Uh, and so all of those influences uh, will play into my recipes and, and just can't wait to continue to hand those recipes out to folks. And more important than a recipe is a method. So recipe is just a guideline, a method. If you know how to straight braise, to grill direct, to grill indirect, to cold smoke, to smoke, you can manipulate that into whatever recipe that you want to. You go to the grocery store and you need some kind of vinegar, but they don't have it, well, you shouldn't be so stuck on that. It says, oh my gosh, what do I do? Just look around at what they've got, find something similar and make it your own. That's how you find the next big thing. Somebody asked about when you're cooking larger cuts of meat, like a brisket or a pork shoulder, they're the same size, but they don't cook in the same amount of time, and they want to know if there was a way to be able to judge what yeah. they're going to finish. That's, that's a great one, and, and Josh and I and Chef Tom were talking about that earlier. Uh, so let's take brisket, for instance. You know, no two briskets are, are exactly alike. Even though it's the same cut, uh, you know, they're going to cook a little bit differently. Perhaps that animal had a little bit more work. Uh, you know, when I say work, that, that, that animal's moved around a lot more than another animal. Well, the fat content is going to be a little bit different. Uh, you know, the muscle, muscle is going to be a little bit different. So it's going to cook a little bit different. That's why we constantly monitor what it is that's going on on that grill. Or we set it low and slow, low enough to where uh, we give ourselves time so that connective tissue is going to break down and that collagen turns to gelatin. Because that's all we want when we're doing something like that. You know, we're only going to get a certain amount of smoke on something. Uh, but that low and slow that, that allows things to break down is going to happen at a different rate with different animals. And that's why a lot of folks, I believe it's Creekstone that, uh, that we use here a lot at, at All Things Barbecue in Wichita, Kansas. That's what we're going to be using. Uh, all, all our B-Procs are coming from them for the Camacho Block Party from 11 to 3. Uh, this coming Saturday here, uh, you know, if you if you can zone in on one of these farms that you really like, you're going to find more consistency than choosing briskets or same cuts of meat from different farms. If that makes sense. Somebody asked about the possibility of cold smoke and having cold smoke cheese on Camacho. I love cold smoke and cheese. Yes, absolutely. A lot of people think cold smoking is just getting smoke on something without heat. Uh, you know, you want to make sure you're under 70 degrees. Uh, yeah, cold smoke is not a problem. So what I do is I just don't put a whole lot of charcoal in my firebox. You know, think about it. If I'm going to put a whole bunch of fuel into something and light it from the bottom, and it's going to have total access to it, even if I'm whispering uh, the draft door in the, in the control tower, I'm still going to have the possibility of generating a lot of heat. So, of course, we do it indirect with the deflector shields. Uh, and you want to get a good smoke going, you need to have that combustion. So have a small amount of, uh, of, of charcoal, uh, you know, of natural lump, of Camacho natural lump, and put some of those blocks in there. Make sure that they catch fire, have those deflector shields in, and maybe you even push that fire to the back and you've got the cheese to the front. That's another way of kind of separating it in that same cooking zone or same cooking surface that love cold smoking fish, love cold smoking sausages, uh, and cheese especially. You know, making your own smoked gouda is something pretty cool when you're doing a smoked gouda potato cake or, or, or smoked gouda lobster mac and cheese. Play around with it. That's, that's just one of the amazing methods that you're able to do in this. It's not just grilling anymore. Re redefining what it means to grill. Uh, and again, the versatility of the Kamada Joe just allows you to explore that on your own time. Oh my gosh, my favorite thing to cook, I always, I always say this and I mean it in all sincerity, my favorite thing to cook is the meal to come because I'm so excited about what's next. Uh, but uh, 
I'm a seafood guy. True and true, I'm a seafood guy. We came here to Wichita, Kansas. Chef Tom's hooked us up with some amazing tuna. We're going to do tuna tataki. I love doing mussels on the, uh, on the Kamada Joe. Uh, I brought some grouper cheeks. Let me reach down here real quick and just... They're in, a, they're in a bag, but they're, they're these little circular pieces of the, of the grouper just, just under the eye, above the jaw. Amazing cheeks. Uh, I think seafood is something that not a lot of people do extremely well. Remember, less is more. Uh, what else do we have? We've, we've got halibut that we're going to play around with. I think we're going to make uh, one of the beautiful things about seafood is just a little bit of salt and a little bit of a nice olive oil and you got a beautiful thing. Uh, but of course I like making sauces as well. So we're gonna do a pineapple togarashi butter sauce uh, on top of the, uh, maybe that's on the Escalar. Uh, but we got, we got about five or six different things. And I always like cooking something that I've never cooked before. So I keep on uh, seeing these great Instagram posts of people doing octopus. You know, I've been a chef all around the world. I have yet to cook octopus. So if somebody out there has a great recipe on how to make that bad boy tender, uh, I've just never done it before, so I guess I guess doing something that I've never done, especially with seafood, is is my uh, is my favorite. Another brisket question: to wrap or not to wrap? Guys, I, I gotta be honest. Uh, I'm a rapper. I might not look like it, but I'm a rapper. All right. Uh, a lot of people. I saw something earlier today. You know, do you use tin foil or do you use butcher butcher paper? And what about the bark and all of this? Um, so one thing that we're going to do, and I've got a video coming out in a couple weeks that I actually corn a brisket, and I know that's not what you're alluding to, but I corn it for 10 days, then I smoke it for three hours, and then I wrap it and cook it low and slow for another 12 hours, uh, and I wrap mine in a, uh, a cellophane, okay? So as long as you're under 230 degrees, that cellophane's not going to wrap, but what happens internally is, is, you know, at first it's already been smoked, that's a dry heat method, then it starts to balloon up a little bit so it's steaming inside then that collagen turns to gelatin starts breaking down and as long as it's over 200 212 it's simmering a little bit and then once that collagen breaks down even further you have more fat content almost surrounding the whole entire thing for the last eight hours of that cook it's more like a confit at that point i like to refrigerate it that fat content adheres to it it's continuing to season overnight and then i like to bring it up slowly and when you slice into that and I know a lot of people I know this isn't traditional okay I had somebody early ask me what's the most non-traditional way you like to cook a brisket boom folks this is it all right so really get that to break down bring it up slow and slice it you got to make sure you got a razor sharp knife because this thing is just falling apart uh, and that's actually so we've turned it into a pastrami at that point right because we've smoked it put a little coriander maybe a little black pepper on there um, that's how I make my Rubens, and I make a killer, killer Reuben. So for me, uh, brisket is a very fun thing to cook. I'm from North Carolina, though, so I'm more pork friendly than I am brisket friendly. I think we're going to tap into Chef Tom's uh, uh, brisket knowledge here this weekend in Wichita, Kansas at All Things Barbecue. Remember, 11 o'clock to 3 o'clock. I don't care if you're in North Carolina or Texas, fly on over. It's going to be awesome. What else we got, Dream Team? Do you have any favorite cookbooks or places you go for inspiration? I get inspiration from everywhere, uh, and, and this day, these day, day and age with social media, you know, it's out there, but sometimes I see what the guys at Kamada Joe are doing on their, on their uh, every other Friday, they do a big cookout in the parking lot. We got this guy uh, rocking out pizzas, Gabriel, he's doing some unbelievable stuff. It's not just pizza, right? I'll show you how to make the dough, make it into a stromboli or a calzone. Take those everyday things and make them extraordinary things. Uh, a couple guys who I'm really impressed with right now, Adam Perry Lang doing some really neat stuff. Of course, Francis Malman down there in Argentina, I believe, rocking out. Uh, he's got this great book, Seven Fires, that, that I'm in love with. Uh, of course, Eric Repair, been a big influence in my life. Anthony Bourdain's been a big influence in my life. Had the chance to hang out with those two cats in uh, uh, the Cayman Islands for about a week at the Cayman Cookout. So, uh, unbelievable stuff. Chef Tim loves killing it right now. So uh, Ashley Christensen in, in North Carolina, uh, some, of the, some of these barbecue guys that, that have been going hard for 65 years plus that, that are still over, still raking the coals and now finally getting, uh, getting their name out there. I love seeing that. So it's, 
It's a tough lifestyle being a chef. I think anybody who's out there putting themselves out there in front of people in social media, uh, I give them credit because, golly, it's so easy for somebody to beat you up online, you know. So anybody who's out there doing neat stuff, I, I, I love that. I, I give as much credit out as I can. So the jotisserie, everybody cooks whole chicken. That. So what else would you cook on that, on that rotisserie system for the Kamado So we're just in Nashville for the block party down there. We partner with Yazoo Brewery, and uh, there's this pork farm I love to partner with, Cheshire uh, Pork Her Heritage Farms, and they, they sent us a steamship. Whenever I think of a steamship, I think of a beef steamship, right? It's this big round back there. Uh, but this is pretty much an uncooked ham with a French bone. So we plug that baby in there, put a nice seasoning on there, put it on the rotisserie. And whenever I use the rotisserie for right or wrong, I like to push my coals to the very back. And again, I'm not using a whole heck of a lot, a lot of coals. Uh, and I start that rotisserie up and you make sure you, you plug that, that spit all the way through the direct center so that it's rotatingly evenly. Uh, and we did this massive uh, steamship round from Heritage Farms, this big pork steamship round. I think I got there at Yazoo at like 6.30 a.m. We took it off at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so it had been rotating the whole time. We were basting it with a, uh, a bourbon dream sauce. It was just out of this world. You know, and of course you stand it up, you let go, and it's big enough where it just stands up, and you slice towards the bone. Uh, what else have I seen out there? I've seen suckling pigs. That Big Joe is big enough to do a suckling pig on. You can do multiple birds if you want to, so plug in multiple birds. Uh, I've seen some of these aftermarket baskets that they're doing some fun stuff with. Uh, what else have I seen on the rotisserie? Uh, I don't know, sometimes I just like even saying jotisserie. You yeah, know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fun play on words. Uh, you know, and any, any opportunity I get. I, I do a spatchcock chicken, which, is, which I think is my daughter's favorite. My wife swears by the rotisserie chicken. She says it's even better. Uh, she's the boss, too. So, hey, Jenny. Uh, you know, but we, uh, I love spinning anything I can. I've I seen, I seen a guy in, in Canada, Rakesh, put this massive, uh, you know, usually we see the tomahawks, but if you've got the ribeye and the French bones coming off, he had like four tomahawks that hadn't been separated, and he's spinning that, you know, smoking it for a couple hours. So, you know, you can draw intrigue, you can raise your flavor profile and keep your moisture content all at the same time. You want to throw a party and have a wow factor, that rotisserie is king. I cook on the Joe lit up quite a bit, especially when I'm using cast iron. Uh, we got a segment tomorrow on uh, the ABC affiliate here. Was it cake? Unbelievable. Some of the stuff they're doing. I've seen Chef Tom on there killing it. Uh, I think that's going to be from 8 to 9 o'clock. We got a six minute segment going on tomorrow, so check that out. We're going to be using the cast iron and the soapstone, I think. Uh, and so I'll cook lit up when I'm doing thin items. You know, if, if you hand me any piece of meat and you tell me, I can see how thick it is and you tell me what part of the animal it comes from, I can tell you whether it's going to be a fast and furious cook or a low and slow cook. Uh, and so something like a lamb rack that I cut into lollipops that I'm just going to sear to a medium rare, that's something that I don't really need to close the lid on. Now if I want to capture some of that, some of that flavor, that blue smoke or some of that sear smoke, uh, I'll close the rid, lid briefly. But again, anything that I'm going to cook for 45 seconds and then flip in another 45 seconds and it's done, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't normally close the lid on that. Sometimes scallops even. Something that you want a big sear on but don't want to cook it past medium rare and it's going to take less than a minute and a half, that's when I leave the lid open. You mentioned the soapstone surface. How is it different than cast iron? From what I understand, the soapstone is a non-porous uh, surface. So. You know, when we were down, I mentioned we were down in the Caymans a while ago, we, we were able to get that temperature to about 700 degrees and take a seasoned scallop and just kind of roll it across the surface. And it was searing as it was rolling. I got all these chefs from all around the world just oohing and on about it. Soapstone was the deal, you know. Cast iron, I love it. I grew up with it. Uh, I feel like I can do anything in it and on it. Uh, but something about that, that, it's like cooking on butter. You know, if you want to get just a complete sear, even a dry sear, uh, that soapstone does a great job of completely searing it. Think about, you know, what, what that surface looks like on cast iron, and it feels really uh, uh, granulated almost, right? There's little bumps, hills, and valleys throughout the whole thing. That soapstone is just completely smooth. I mean, just um, smooth, you know what I mean?
Yeah. If you could only cook on one size, and you could only have one junior classic or big general wine. Golly, that's a tough one. Great question, great question. Uh, I love the versatility of the Joe Jr. because I throw that baby in the back of my truck with my kids and we go anywhere with it. I put that thing in a canoe before and gone to an island and cooked, uh, you know, spend the night. I, I love the versatility uh, and the weight factor of that Joe Jr. Uh, the classic for me uh, is an unbelievable... That's really hard to say. I'm just right now I'm battling my mind. Big Joe or the classic. Uh, if I only had to have one for the rest of my life, of course it's got to be the Big Joe because what if I wanted to do a, a, a big old massive steamship or a suckling pig and then I, it's also, you know, because of, the, because of the, the natural lump charcoal and the way it works, as soon as I'm done, if I only need to sear one steak, I could bring that baby up to seven, 800 degrees and then I could, I could shut it down and reuse that charcoal the next day. So it's not like I'm using a lot more charcoal between the big and the classic. Um, but the first grill I ever had was the, was the classic. So I, how do you choose between your children? You know, I, I just don't know how to answer that. Uh, super, super question, super question. So they're saying they also can't hear the question super well, so if you can repeat it after I ask. Ten four. So yep. Um, asked uh, pork shoulder skin on or skin off. I like to do, let's just say it like this, I like to do, bell, oh, say, uh, so the question was pork shoulder, skin on or skin off? Uh, and I would say skin off for sure. Uh, you know, we're talking Boston butt here. Uh, you know, a, a lot of times I've been asked fat cap on or off, uh, and that draws a lot of controversy. For me, if I'm getting, if I'm getting the skin on uh, a pork shoulder, I'm taking that off and I'll, I'll probably turn that into cracklings, you know? I mean, I, I'm a big fan of that. Same thing with the belly. Sometimes I'll leave the skin on the belly through a braising process on the grill and then take it off in the end, just holds everything together. Uh, let's talk fat cap on or off right now. Uh, there's these guys in North Carolina in Raleigh uh, called Grill Billies, this guy Joe Pino. And my whole entire life, I've been keeping the fat cap on there and keeping it up and thinking as that renders out, it's basting the whole thing. Of course, I season it just like all the other sides of the, of the, uh, of the pork butt. Um, but he says, well, well, really, you know, you, you're just, all that seasoning gets swiped off and, and thrown away. So you're, you're losing a whole surface area of real estate that you could have had smoke on, that you could have had seasoning on. Uh, and I get that. He's, he's got a great way of getting scientific and showing me why I'm wrong. And then I get my feelings hurt because barbecue, you know, we, we really, uh, you know, we really stick true to what it is we think we know. It's hard for anybody to come up and say, uh, hey, you should try this a little bit different. Because this is all based on tradition and, and feelings. And uh, I think that's why we're so passionate about what it is we're doing, right? So I would say skin off on the pork, pork butt. And I would say, Joe Pino, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say fat cap on, even though I know that probably the right answer is, uh, is fat cap off. But I'm gonna continue to do it the way that I was taught to do it. So, uh, Eastern North Carolina style, fat cap on, fat cap up. Yep. Favorite type of wood to cook with? Does it depend on type of meat, or do you cook with one type all the time, kind of as you go to? Sure, favorite kind of wood to, uh, to cook on. I'll be honest, I've been stuck on this Kamadjo big block. You know, I think it's a, a melage of three different types of wood, uh, some kind of white oak uh, down in South America in Argentina that's, that's, that's unbelievable. You can look it up. There's, if you go to the Kamadjo website, there's unbelievable photographs of how they have these huge brick or clay, clay uh, kilns almost, and they stack these massive big old uh, tree trunks in there and they I think they burned for like three weeks the whole story's there they went down took a film crew you have to go online and see this stuff kamatajoe.com look at how they're making the charcoal as far as smoking woods go uh, it does depend on what it is we're, we're doing um, uh, I like to use a sugar maple when I'm doing turkeys you know Come every uh, Ththanksgiving, I do, I do a bunch of spatchcock uh, injected turkeys, and I'll use sugar maple for that. Uh, almost everything else, I'm using hickory. Uh, again, it's just, and that's, there's no right or wrong answer to that. It's, it's just what you, what you grew up on, and that's why, that's why it's, it's subjective. It's culinary arts. You know, it's something somebody's going to tell me one way, and I'm going to try it another, and somewhere in between is, is the right answer, you know. 
Uh, so again, big block charcoal because I absolutely love it. In fact, I started making vinaigrettes with it and seasoning it. I made a smoked big block vinaigrette in Amsterdam. Uh, we had a couple block parties out that way in London, Amsterdam, Holland. Uh, and it blew my mind. It was one of the most progressive things I've ever seen off of, off of a, a, a grill, Kamado style or not. Unbelievable. What's your favorite budget cut of meat? Budget cut. Well, thanks a lot, Food Network. You know, every time I fall in love with something, they pop it up there and it goes up $3 a pound, right? You used to love the short rib. Rachel Ray, somebody got a hold of it. Now it's, you know, it used to be 50 cents a pound, right? Uh, pork butt, you know, that, that's, that's gone up. So uh, hanger steak, there's only one of them per cow. That's not cheap anymore. Uh, I love the cheap stuff, okay? I love making head cheese, uh, you know. So you get into some of this charcuterie and some of this old world stuff, the pâtés and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm doing a lot of talking without actually answering a darn question. Let me think about it for a second. Uh, pig ears are a huge thing for me. I got a got a buddy uh, down in Wilmington, North Carolina, that's got a restaurant called RX, and he's he's doing a, a play on a chicken wing, on a buffalo wing. He's making buffalo pig ears and does it with a blue cheese celery slaw. Uh, pig ears you could do a lot with that collagen. If you if you treat it just right, will come out nice and crispy, but have a little pull to it. That's magic, folks. Uh, check out the cookbook. Uh, another budget cut that I really, really enjoy. There's so much you can do with the pork butt that people aren't doing. And the way I, the way, when I'm saying pork butt, the way I differentiate it is you've got your Boston butt and you've got your picnic uh, ham, right? So we're talking about the whole shoulder here. For me in North Carolina, the upper part, right, up north of North Carolina is Boston. So that's your Boston butt. And then you need your leg to walk to a picnic. So that's how I remember Boston butt, picnic ham. Uh, the Boston butt, if you cut that into 12 ounce pieces, smoke it, wrap it, cook it low and slow, you got the opportunity to serve that up as your own personalized little pork butt uh, that you can shred on your own plate. Your guests can shred on their own plate and kind of wipe up any sauce that they like. That's something we called uh, the pork bomb. We created that. So that's a budget cut that's turned into, a, you know, we sold over a million dollars worth of that cut with, with the restaurants. So. Uh, you know, that's something that'll be in the Camacho cookbook for sure. So somebody asked, in your opinion, where's the best barbecue in Raleigh, North Carolina? Oh my gosh, in my opinion, where's the best barbecue in Raleigh, North Carolina? You all are going to get me in huge trouble here. Uh, you know, I would, I would have to say the best barbecue I've ever had in my entire life uh, was probably uh, a church picnic. You know, I, I don't I don't want to put I don't want to put a finger on anywhere specific. Uh, you know, you're driving down North Carolina. I'd say every other yard has a hog cooker, uh, you know, um, and I think eastern North Carolina, you know, the sauces are different. Right. I can taste a barbecue and tell you not what county it came from, but at least what region in North Carolina it came from. Uh, when you're Goldsboro style or Eastern North Carolina, your true vinegar base, you get down in South Carolina, they start introducing mustard. Uh, when you get into Piedmont, North Carolina, you start seeing some tomato base. Uh, so you can really tell, and don't, don't, don't mention this to everybody, but, and, and now with allergies, it's kind of a big deal, but people on the East Coast will sneak a little, they'll, they'll pop a couple oysters and get a little oyster juice in there and bring that umami flavor, and that takes it from a, from a 10 to a 12. Uh, but if you got a shellfish allergy or, or you don't eat shellfish, obviously that'd be an issue. But uh, sneak that one in next time you try. I don't, I don't want to pick anybody in particular. There's amazing barbecue all throughout North Carolina, and I, and I love it all for its individuality. Right, this will be the last question. Last <laughs> Do you make your own rubs, use commercial seasonings, both? I'd say a little bit of both. You know, it depends on what it is I'm doing. Uh, I've fallen in love with certain dry rubs uh, from certain companies for layering. You, you might have heard us uh, talk about white, red, brown, and then we coined white, red, brown. That's the way we throw it down. Uh, you know, so when we're seasoning things, take what it is you like. Take the, take the salts, the onion powders, and the garlic powders and layer that on first, not too thick. So that's the white. And what that's going to do, that salt is going to start wicking moisture out due to osmosis. It's just going to start getting wet. That's going to dampen the second layer, which is red. Red your heat, your cayenne, your chili powders, your paprikas. 
uh, and then again, due to due to nature, uh, the, the cellular walls, you know, they, they just lost moisture. They're going to want to uh, get back to equilibrium. They're going to start soaking back in, so it's going to flavor brine on the outside just a little bit. So you've got the white, you've got the red. Now it's damp, so when you put it on, it's not all going to fall off. The last layer is brown. White sugar is also brown due to its caramelization properties, and that's going to help you get a big bark there. Uh, so oftentimes, I'll make my own rubs and just kind of take that and split it up into the three and then layer it. And that's another way of creating an amazing flavor profile. Whereas if you just took those same exact seasonings and mixed them up and put them on, it just wouldn't quite be the same. Um, there are a couple seasonings that I like. I got a different one for, for pork butts than I do pork bellies, of course. You know, the fat content's going to tell you if you need more salt or less salt. Uh, if it's low and slow versus fast and furious, you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require different, uh, different seasonings, different rubs. So I've got, I've got one for darn near everything. I wish I had my book here. It's about a, about a stack that thick. Uh, again, but willing to, willing to share, share every single bit of it. So, uh, guys, Eric Gephardt here, Kamada Joe, coming to you live from all things barbecue, Wichita, Kansas. So excited to be here. Thanks for the amazing questions. We're going to hop around to a couple farms. We're going to be taking the film crew with us, so we'll keep you up to date on what's going on. But again, if you can get out here uh, from 11 to 3 o'clock on Saturday, all things barbecue, come check us out. We'll have the Kamada Joes fired up. We'll have Chef Tom fired up. Check out his awesome videos out there. And again, the whole thing's about building meaningful relationships with people. Uh, you know, we position Kamada Joe is a sexy brand, and this is part of it. Come out and enjoy it. Uh, see what see what the new Kamada Joes are all about, and come cook on it yourself. It's not about what Chef Eric can do. Nobody cares about what Chef Eric can do. I'm going to give you the recipes. I'm going to hand you over the, the tomahawks. When was the last time you cooked a steak that was a, a $90 steak? You know, I want you to be able to do it. So I get all the stuff. Chef Tom and I are going to set it all up. We're going to step back, hand you the tongs, and uh, and do a little little coaching and a little listening. Some of the best recipes I've gotten have been from traveling the world and listening to what people have to say. That's part of the beauty of this, all right? It's not a one-way ser sermonic conversation. Uh, or, you know, I want to hear what you guys have to say. Share, share the recipes that you've got, and uh, can't, wait to, can't wait to see you out there on the road. But again, Wichita, Kansas, Saturday, all things barbecue from 11 to 4. Cheers, folks. Hope to see you.